Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Kanani Lee, and I'm from Yale. And today, I'm going to take you out of the solar system. We've heard a lot this week about all the cool kinds of geophysics that we can do within our own solar system. But now let's see what we can do beyond our solar system. So I think one of the, the coolest talks um, that, we, uh, that we've seen this week uh, was about, or wasn't even, wasn't, wasn't even from one of us, which we've had fantastic talks, so this is really, this is really setting the, the bar high, but was about the possibility of measuring the normal modes on Saturn, which was just purely amazing. And so to think that we can get those kind of measurements um, gives me hope that we can do, we can get a lot more observations that, than exist for the exoplanets that have been uh, that have been discovered. And the numbers are now, and I'll, and I'll give a, a more recent um, values, are more than 1,500 confirmed uh, exoplanets. <clears throat> so today, I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, comparisons. okay? And prim primarily, I'm going to be talking about the terrestrial uh, type exoplanets, or the super-Earths. Okay? And so these are planets that are um, that we're going to define as being between 1 and 10 Earth masses. Okay? The composition can be whatever we want sort of within that, within that realm. And then we're going to try and see if we can compare that with the terrestrial planets of our own solar system, which we know are very different, <coughs> just given the, you know, the sort of surface features that we can observe. Um, you know, we can have ones that are quite pockmarked, uh, with lots of craters, the beautiful images uh, that uh, Laurent showed us earlier this week um, on Venus, showing some, you know, evidence perhaps of of plates or stagnant plates or what have you, um, <clears throat> as well as on as on Mars. Of course, we know we all love and know the Earth uh, quite well, but these super Earths. are looking to be really pretty different so far. Okay. So here's just, a, and this is actually, a, these, you know, these figures, uh, once you make them, they pretty much go obsolete because, because they're finding so many planets. Uh, <coughs> but this is a figure that was put together probably about a year ago now. And um, it shows along the, uh, along the bottom axis mass with respect to Earth masses, so um, up to 10 Earth masses. And then the equilibrium temperature, the temperature that one would predict at the surface of these planets. And this is based uh, just on the distance from um, that each of these planets are from their respective stars, as well as how bright those stars are. Okay, and so you can see that here, I think there's about a dozen planets shown in a, in a later figure. I'll, I think this is up to about 18 confirmed super-Earths. <clears throat> and so a lot of them, which is hard to tell, there are a lot of them have been found uh, by the Kepler mission, so they're they're shown here with uh, Kepler as their as the first um, as their first names. But then there are also some planets that have been found before the Kepler uh, mission, like GJ 1214b, <coughs> uh, where are you? 55 Cancri e, Caro 7b. Uh, the naming convention here uh, goes with the name of the star, okay, and then the the letter that follows it. B, as is the case with a lot of these, but you could get B, C, D, E. These are the, the um, this goes with how uh, the first, second, third uh, numbers of plan uh, planets that they have found around a particular star. So we're up to, I believe if I'm not, again, if my data isn't obsolete, um, the largest multi-planet solar, uh, solar system that has been found has seven planets uh, orbiting it, okay? So that would be B, C, D, E, F, G, H planets, okay, around a particular star. All right, so you can go to your favorite uh, exoplanets catalog, and there's several online. Uh, this one here, exoplanets.org. So as of a few days ago, there were 1,518 total confirmed planets. Most of these uh, are from the Kepler mission, okay, so they were using the transit uh, technique. I'll briefly go over those uh, in a bit. 
Uh, or you could choose uh, this particular catalog, okay, the European catalog. They're up to 1,800 planets, uh, and there's one even put by NASA at uh, just over 1,700 planets. So there are a lot of planets, and one might ask, you know, what, what's the difference between each of these catalogs? And I think everyone has their favorite. Uh, <coughs> but uh, if you go, if, if I ask my, my collaborators, they're like, ah, uh, only trust the exoplanets.org. Forgive me if I offend anyone. Um, they vetted um, these uh, measurements. Yep. Quick question, Kanani. So um, there's like 4,000 Kepler candidates and only 1,500 confirmed. What does what does it take for a planet to be a candidate versus confirmed? Yeah. So the, so uh, so in the Kepler mission. In the in the Kepler mission, um, what they're doing is they're looking at a particular region in space. And um, and they're looking for all of the um, uh, all of these stars that kind of look like the sun, so about the same mass and a, about the same age, uh, and that's based on the color of the of the of the star. And um, what they can do, I mean, they have lots and lots and lots of data, so they can identify these particular stars, um, and you know they might see, oh, okay, yeah, look, there could be some. Um, there could be some dimming because these are all transit measurements. Uh, but they'll go back later and you know actually analyze all this data and see if you can uh, actually see true dimming and then make some um, calculations. So it's a matter of going through a lot of the data, right? Um, and you can help analyze the data uh, if you're interested. Um, you know they they have uh, you can you know use your laptop and 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 help run. Um, uh, run these uh, calculations to actually see if you can um, identify some of these as, as being truly identified. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> anyway, there are many, there are many planets that have been confirmed. Okay? Um, we see that in our own solar system, there's quite a diversity in the chemistry of, of our planets. And so it's not hard to imagine then we might see similar kind of chemistry in these other planets. And certainly that was the first thought, right? Oh, well, of course. If we see other planets, we're going to find analogs to all of our own planets in those solar systems. And so if we look at the, and this, this is, this figure is quite old, but the, but this, but the, it, but the number of points on here have just gotten denser. Okay. Um, basically, here I'm plotting uh, the planet mass, and this is in reference to Jupiter mass. Okay, so Jupiter, Jupiter is about three, four hundred times uh, the mass of the Earth. Okay, so these are pretty massive planets. And then it's plotted versus <coughs> semi-major axis, so essentially the distance away, uh, away uh, from their stars. <coughs> Here in the letters are where our solar system planets would lie. Okay, so here's Venus and Earth. Okay, so we're one AU from the Sun, and we're much less massive than than uh, uh, than a Jupiter. And in this compilation, you can see that there are a lot of really massive planets, some many times more massive than Jupiter, and also a hell of a lot closer to their stars. A lot of this is a is a as a bias on how we can collect and how certainly these early data were collected, it's much easier to see the signal from a very large planet close up because uh, <coughs> the, the, the signal that we're seeing is looking at how much the, the star is actually sort of wobbling because of the, because of the um, gravitational attraction that a very large planet would have very close up to its star. Okay, so we have, uh, so the term uh, hot Jupiter was, was, was first dubbed. But as, um, as these uh, more and more planets have been found, uh, we actually have found quite a few uh, that are much less massive um, and thereby making a smaller gravitational uh, pull against their star uh, in the last uh, several years. Okay, so this, you know, if you add up all of these, you know, you're talking about 500 or so planets. <coughs> Now, I, a few slides ago, I, sh I showed you the, the sort of expected temperature, uh, the equilibrium to surface temperature that one might calculate for uh, each of these planets based on their distance from their stars. Uh, and so, 
here, um, here are some of, some of those planets uh, shown uh, versus temperature. So the, the warmer colors uh, denote a higher temperature. Um, and the size of the, of the, of the circles uh, denote how large we actually think these are. Yep. Do you know what one of these graphs would look like if you normalized the planetary mass to their s star that they're orbiting? Would it look so, less um, severe? Yeah. Um, s on this one, uh, no. I mean, most of these, the earliest ones, um, they weren't uh, they weren't really making a distinction on trying to find uh, solar mass type stars, but the later ones, uh, we're looking for ones that look most like the sun. Okay, so so they would all be sort of ratioed to the same size. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're right. So so if you're. Um, so it's really, it's easy to see really, so especially in these early ones, it's really, or even today, it's really easy to see a really big planet because it's got a lot of pull. And if that star is, is, is you know, relatively small, then it would, yeah, you would see more of, a, of, a, an, of an effect. But the, 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 the and, same, and same for transit, yes. <laughs> Sorry. As, as we continually get more and more data, would you expect this to just fill out to, to some degree? Or do you think it's always going to lie in that sort of quadrant? Yeah, no, it has, it has filled out. Uh, I mean, it's the, so for the ones that are, are further away, that's, that's yeah. just going to take more time because, uh, because they're orbiting at um, you know, much farther distance. The chance of seeing them is really hard, right? I, the I chance of you. seeing them is really hard, right? That's right. That's right. So, 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 for instance, in our, if if we were outside of our solar system trying to look at the sun and the effects of the planets within our solar system and how much it would wobble, Jupiter, which would have the biggest effect because it's got the most mass, has a 12-year uh, orbit. So, if you wanted to see something periodic, you would need to look, you know, sort of on those time scales, preferably longer. So, these ones that are right up close. I mean, we're talking about you know the periods that are hours to days to to months. So those are much shorter times because they're easier to see because we have longer times to look at them, or longer longer time to see many many cycles. Are you going to talk about how these are detected? How, how the detect how they're detected yes. because that will help because the Kepler mission went it's done and it only ran for what three years. Yeah. So that's. That's, you need to take that into account. So if you're going to show how, how you detect them, I'll shut up. Yeah, I'm going to show that in, a, in, in just a bit. Okay. <laughs> so what I wanted to, so what I wanted to show to you on, on this uh, on this figure though, um, are the kinds of temperatures that we're that we're looking at. Okay. Um, so, you know, here here's Jupiter, here's Earth. Okay. We're sort of low temperature, right? We're, whatever, 300 Kelvin at the surface of Earth, okay? Um, and, we're, and we're tiny, okay? Some of these other planets, and they're, you know, there's actually some pretty, some smaller planets here. Kepler-11b is considered a super-Earth. Um, it has a, a mass uh, less than 10 Earth masses. Um, but, the, but the temperature, the surface temperature, is, is expected to be somewhere around, mm, I don't know, 1,100, 1,200, uh, degree C. That's a pretty hot surface. Okay? And then you can go to some of these other ones, which are much bigger, granted. So they're, they've got sizable mass. They're, they're much bigger than Jupiter, but they've got surface temperatures more than 2,000 degrees. Okay, so so the, you know, the one question uh, that you might ask is, how does something so hot retain such, you know, such you know, retain such uh, atmospheres. Presumably, if you know, if our if our model is, if our idea of how planets form and so forth um, are correct, these should be mostly you know hydrogen and helium. Okay. <coughs> I'm not going to say much more about hydrogen and helium today, so <laughs> um, we're going to stick to the to, to the to the smaller planets, to the super Earths. But these are sort of questions that might obviously come up, and as we'll see. 
Um, there are lots of planets, this one here, and there are ones that are not plotted on here, where we actually have surface temperature measurements. Okay? So we can calculate what the temperature is. Okay? That's an easy back of the envelope type of calculation. And then we can measure the temperature. And so we're getting you know, temperature measurements of like 2,500 degrees Kelvin for some of these planets that are really close up. Okay? So these are hot. Or some of these are hot, the ones that are close. Yes. Suki. Or Mike, sorry, Michael, oh, then Suki. He's got the. <laughs> um, I just had, don't remember where the sun falls relative to the top of your scale on planet temperature. Oh, so um, the, the sun surface temperature is like 5,500 Kelvin, something like that. Surface temperature 55, 6,000, something like that. 57. Yeah. Oh, oh. Michael had a question. Given these temperatures, if you calculate the kinetic energy of gases at that temperature compared to the, and compare it to the gravitational attraction from the planet, are they losing gas? Uh, some would be, yeah. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Yeah, um, are these, for the temperature measurements, those are like assuming no atmosphere or something like that? So the temperature measurements, um, uh, and there haven't been that many. It's just like the radiation. At, just a radi at right, X, that's yeah. just a radiation. And um, they're generally taken at a single color. So yeah. there's a lot of assumptions in it. But, um, but the, you know, sort of the, the temperature that you would calculate based on just the distance. It's not like we're, you know, it would calculate at 300 actually, degrees and then we're measuring 2,000 or anything so like that. They're, they're not they're actually not. measuring the temperature. They're just looking at the distance between the star and the planet and calculating the radiation. That's right. Yeah. For most of the for most of the temperatures that are shown here, but there are there are a couple planets that have temperature measurements um, that also suggest that you know that those equilibrium temperatures are not far off. Uh, more. Um, so I vaguely remember from some class that you can use um, the spectrum or something from the star to, to roughly calculate its age. Mm -hmm. So um, is, it, is it known or is it possible to show or investigate whether the, these planets that have to be losing mass just from the Ke of their, sur of their surface gas are associated with young stars? Because it would be less explained if they're associated with old ones. Maybe. Right. So um, I, 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 have to, I have to say my, my I, I don't know that much about the stars, but since they're looking for, for mostly, um, at least in the Kepler mission, they're looking for ones that were like the sun. Um, they're not far off in age. Uh, uh, there are older, there are older, um, there are older stars. So for instance, uh, so 55 Cancri, um, which are actually, it's a binary system. Um, that star system is estimated to be something like 8 billion years old. So not young, and it has and it has uh, you know one of these super Earths right up next to it. So it's it's maybe we just got lucky and it's just on its way in, but that doesn't seem doesn't doesn't seem like that would that would that would be um, plausible. But yeah, old stars, old stars. Okay, great. So um, cl clearly there'll be some diversity, right? There'll be some diversity um, both in the surface or just in the temperatures, uh, surface and interior, um, and that's going to be uh, due not only to its distance but also into its composition. Okay, so its composition is going to affect uh, sort of its dynamics. All right, so Wendy asks, am I going uh, to give you a primer on how these things are, are found? And sure, and, 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 and probably many of you have seen, um, you know, have, have, have seen uh, uh, a seminar like this where, where they discuss how these exoplanets have been detected. And so I'll go over the, the most popular um, ways that, uh, that have been used. Okay, so the, uh, the oldest way uh, that we've been able to detect these planets, okay, the first ones were detected about 20 years ago, okay, uh, is through this radial velocity type measurement or a Doppler uh, measurement. And this is what this is a schematic of what it what it looks like. Okay. So here you've got we've got a telescope and we're looking at a particular star. And what we see then is sometimes when we look at the same star, the the spectrum that's coming from it 
has you know one uh, one flavor looks you know we, we see the spectrum of its hydrogen and helium lines okay and then at another time um, that spectrum seems to be redshifted okay so we can see the and, and, we, and, and it's periodic so we can see sort of this star wobble okay, as we're looking at it and this is just due to a wobbling of the star along or a, around a center of mass between it and a planet or planets. Okay? So the first one, the, these first uh, radio velocity measurements, uh, you know, they were seen, so the thing that can tug the most on a, on a star is something really close to it and really massive. Okay? So we were finding a lot of hot Jupiters. We we're seeing this star sort of wobbling around a center of mass. Okay? Here's, and here's the reason it's wobbling around the center of mass is because there's some planet that we can't see because the planets themselves don't give off any, um, any light, but they certainly can give off or have a, have a gravitational uh, field. Okay. Now, this is, a, this is a fantastic way to, to, measure, uh, uh, to measure the wobble of stars. But this is something that we don't know is how we're actually looking at this planet. Are we looking at this planet from some angle? Okay. So you can imagine then, uh, if you were looking at the planet edge on, okay, this is kind of a, normally we like to think of our, of our, of our solar systems sort of in this, in this uh, direction, but, but bear with me. So if we're looking at our, at our, at our, uh, at our star edge on, um, the most Doppler shift we're going to see is when, uh, is when uh, our this solar system is is edge on. We're not going to see as much signal if we're just looking at it face on, okay? Because it's not going to be going in and out of the in and out of the screen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'll show later. There's a technique called astrometry, okay, where if you can see the position of this of this star and you can sort of see it outline a a wobble okay, in this um, sort of face-on view, um, that would be another way to detect. Okay? But you would be looking at, at, at the wobble of the star in, in this plane rather than in, in the out-of-the-screen uh, plane, okay? or out-of-the-screen direction. <clears throat> All right, so, oh, right. So the present resolution that they can look at is about a meter per second. Okay. The, the, kind of, uh, the kind of pull that Jupiter would have on our sun uh, would be about 12 meters per second in terms of how much it would, um, how much the star would move, how much the sun would move. Okay, so here's some of, um, uh, some of the, the first measurements, okay, 1997. Not the first measurement, but a, but a really nice measurement showing the periodicity. Okay, so basically what we're plotting, and you can't really read the, the axes here, um, but this essentially is you know, over time, okay? And we're looking um, here at the sort of the movement of that, of that star. And the measurements are shown here in the triangles and then a fit to that data, which you can see fits really nicely with a sine function. Um, <clears throat> finds that, wow, this thing is, is, is wobbling, and it's wobbling with a period of just over four days. Okay? And we know Kepler's laws, right? So if we, if we have a period of four days, we can calculate just, what the, just what that, um, how far away that, uh, that planet is from the star, and you get 0.05 AU. So it's really close. Do you have a question? Paul? Useful lesson for the students. If one of your axes is periodic and you replot your data every two pi, it makes it look like you have more data than you actually do. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, that's true. Right. Fair enough. But you, but you do have a, you do have most of a period right here. But you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Um, which is why I said you think of that as time, but it is. It's a, it's a, it is a phase. Um, but even with that sort of mostly of a period, it does it does kind of fit a nice you know nice sine function and, and a, this uh, so 51 Pegasi um, has been looked at subsequently and it still follows that you get this nice um, sinusoidal wobble. Okay. 
All right. So this was so this was kind of the bread and butter way to uh, to look for uh, to look for exoplanets, and it's still in use um, today. Uh, but with the but because of the problem with you're not really sure what angle you're looking at uh, your planet, you can't actually know what the mass is exactly. But you can know what the mass is times like sine of some inclination angle, and whatever that inclination angle is, you're not really sure. Okay. So while this will tell you how far away it is from its star, with, you know, with the period, it doesn't actually tell you how massive it is. Okay. But it gives you a, it gives you a bound. <coughs> so let's look at the next the next method, which can um, hopefully further elucidate this. So this is the transit method. And in this method, uh, what we're looking for is we're looking for, uh, we're looking for solar systems or planets that, uh, that we're basically seeing edge on. So we're looking for, for the solar systems where we can see them sort of in the same plane. Okay? We get the big, so that would give us the biggest Doppler si uh, signal. But what it does, what additionally what it gives us is now we can look at the star, basically the flux of light coming out of the star, and see how that changes with time. And if the planet is right along, is going in front of in front of the star, what we'll see is we'll see a drop in the flux of light coming from coming from the star, and that drop in light is going to be periodic. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> So if we have some, if we have some, you know, if we look at, at, at one of the, the radio velocity measurements and say, okay, well, this star certainly has something in front of it. Let's go see if we can actually see the effect of a planet transiting in front of it. We can then, one, confirm the mass, because now we know we're at least, you know, that, that sine i um, is going to be, sine i is going to be uh, 1. Okay, so we can know, or very, very close to one, so we can know the mass uh, pretty well. And then what it tells us, since we already know how far away the star, the, the planet is from the star, given the periodic measurements, okay, we can then uh, model how big that planet has to be in order to block out a percentage of the flux of light. Okay? The other cool thing is, is that it's possible then to also use the star if we know its sort of known kind of chemistry of the star. When this, when the planet goes in front of it, it kind of acts as a, like a backlighter. It just kind of illuminates any any possible atmospheres that might be surrounding this particular planet. And you could then, not an easy measurement, pull away what the atmosphere might be for a planet. Yeah. How small of a planet can you detect with this method? Um, so the smallest planet, so, so we're, this is going to give us the radius of the planet. Um, we're going to see that on in, in a little bit. But the radius, so let me see if I can tell you. Uh, the radius is going to, like, I don't know, close to, a, close to maybe two Earth radii. No, maybe even one Earth radii. Okay. So pretty, not, not bad. We can do this in our own solar system with, with, the, with Venus, for instance, and we can measure Venus um, and and, the, and our own sun's uh, sort of dimming when Venus uh, crosses it. So, so it's 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 certainly doable. Okay. Here's what here's what some data look like. Okay, so this is pretty old. Um, here's the this relative flux. So it's normalized uh, to one. So this would be when the star is has nothing in front of it. Okay. And then a planet transits in front of it. It drops by one and a half percent. Okay, and then it finishes its transit across that star, and then it's back to one. Okay? So you can do this and watch it for a number of days or a number of, of uh, orbits, and see the periodicity and see you know a consistent sort of drop in the in the flux. Okay, so they have really beautiful measurements on on you know on on this. So if we had, if we looked at our own sun and put Earth in front of it, so base, 
so how much you block is not only based on your size, but how far away you are, right? you can imagine, right, you can stick your your thumb up in the sky and then you know you can block out the whole moon, but clearly my thumb is not as big as the moon, right? so that depends on sort of your your um, your perspective. okay? so um, <coughs> so uh, even so, um, uh, your Jupiter, right? Jupiter is going to block out more of the uh, the sun than Earth will. Um, here is uh, Super Earth 55 Cancri E. It's very up, it's very close up to up to uh, one of its stars. 55 Cancri capital A. There is a capital B. It is a binary system. Okay. This one happens to this is a this would be an orbit across of big A, and um, <coughs> The radius of, of 55 Cancri E is about two Earth radii, okay? But um, so it's slightly bigger than the Earth, but it's really close up, okay? So it's got an 18-hour um, orbit. All right, some um, some other ways to detect exoplanets would be by direct imaging. This has been done for a few planets. This was the first measurement here. So um, this one, he so here's your, here's the star. This one actually happens to be a very small star. Um, so your question about like, you know, what kind of star it is. Um, <clears throat> and its planet um, happens to be very far away from it. So this one, this one is, is quite far away. So 55 AU, okay? but you can actually see both here. Now this would be really hard to do if you had a planet right up next to its star. Okay, this star's light would just completely uh, wash out um, any sort of signal from the, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the planet. These are infrared images, so they're measuring sort of the heat of the, of the planet, okay? So this has been done a few times. <clears throat> and then um, finally, this astrometry, Okay, so if you were completely non-edge on, you were looking at, so, so we're looking at our, our, a, a particular star system, you know, down here or up there, um, you might be able to see the, will it run for me again? I don't know if it'll run for me. Whatever, you'll see it, you'll, you'll see the, the star sort of uh, orbit around. Okay. Again, this, this isn't such a, um, such a, a popular way to do it. It's much harder to do this kind of measurement. I was just curious, um, can you use this method at all or any of the other methods to, to uh, measure the eccentricity of the orbit? Yes, yes, actually, and, and, and they have. These eccentricities for a lot of these orbits have been measured. So um, I don't have it in this talk, but uh, I, 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 what I could have shown and what I probably should have shown was um, there was another set of measurements for um, that showed the with the radio velocity measurements or the periodic um, uh, you know change in um, in the the speed of the of the uh, the star and instead of having sort of the typical sign behavior um, instead it was it was more sort of a sawtooth okay so it's still periodic but it wasn't it wasn't, wasn't a, sort of a, a, the traditional sort of sign look, um, but instead it had sort of this um, uh, sawtooth shape. Okay, and so from there um, they can tell, you know, you can model uh, what sort of uh, eccentric orbit would cause that kind of signal. Yeah, but the one uh, for 55, uh, sorry, uh, 51 Pegasi, that was for um, that's a, that was a nicely round orbit, circular orbit. <clears throat> right. Oh, so actually, so so the eccentricity. Why would that be important, right? If you have really eccentric orbits, you can imagine then that a planet, which may be hot, um, you know, for some of its um, for some of its uh, uh, orbit, may get relatively cold. Okay, if you were to sort of calculate. Um, the uh, equilibrium temperature just based on its distance, okay, if you had a very eccentric orbit. So that could become important when we're trying to, or that would become important if we're trying to model kind of what's going on, you know, what would the climate look like, what would, what would the, even the interior dynamics. Another question. So it, even for these kind of 
uh, orbits, one half of the planet will be red shifting and one half blue shifting. So can you see a, a wider spectrum for planets, uh, for suns like this? In this, in this kind of yeah, can of, you see um, widening of a theoretical? I, I have no idea how this. Yeah, is no, going. this would be this would be a lot harder to see using the Doppler method because the Doppler method in this case we would be sort of you know out here that would be in your position trying to trying to look at it. Yeah. And there's no there's no wobble in this direction. So. But there's um, still a lot of redshift and blue shift, uh, say at the edges of the planet. Oh, the, oh, sorry. It, yeah. No, I got it. Yeah. So, so instead, yeah. So, um, so instead of um, looking at the spectra, I mean, you, you would have to see, like, you know, you would have to see the star in the sky, and then you, you would have to see it go like this. Yeah, we weren't, we're not going to see this this bit. It's this is a harder measurement. I, I think there's only maybe I don't know a dozen, two dozen that have been found kind of this way. I, somebody can look this up. I mean, <laughs> there are there are only a handful of of measurements like that. Maybe Simon has a. Uh, this type of measurement will become much more common. Uh, there's a, a new thing. I think I've got the name right. It's Gaia going up that can do this because it has a pre uh, precision to do it much more uh, accurately. And this will be a great complementary data set to the Kepler data set, which only deals with planets that are edge on. This will give us face on planets, which mm -hmm. will be very nice. Yep. All right, so um, hopefully this doesn't make you, uh, you know, too uh, dizzy. Um, this is a an orrery. How did we, we? I looked up how to say, say say this word, Jessica. What was it? Orrery, orrery, orrery. Someone can correct me. Um, <laughs> too many R's, not enough everything else. But um, <laughs> so um, so this was this was put together a couple of years ago, and um, in this compilation, um, which again is is now old and obsolete. What it shows us is all of the multi-planet systems that have been found up to that date. Okay? Um, you, can, you can look this up online and, and, and download it. It's got some beautiful um, movies. But what it shows uh, are the orbits. And the orbits uh, are scaled uh, within the solar system. And the planets are also scaled to each other uh, within that particular solar system. But obviously, the planets um, are in a different scale from their actual orbits. So you know, this planet is not going to be clearing out the one inside of it. Okay? Um, the colors uh, denote the, um, how many planets there actually are. Okay? So at the time, two years ago, the, there, were, there was a six-planet system, and purple, the outermost color, would told you that there were actually six in there. Okay, so, um, and if you only have a yellow planet, then you only have two, if that's your sort of outermost. Okay, so you can go from, in this compilation, two to six, and there are a couple of hundred um, of planets at that point. Okay, but what you can see is that there are just huge differences in the size of the planets and where they are located with respect to their stars. Okay? So, of course, then, we have to expect that there is some chemical diversity. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I looked up to see if this had been um, this had been updated, and sure enough, <laughs> this is updated, and this too is still old. <laughs> but this is the latest one, and um, for some reason the movie is not working. But you can download a, uh, or you can see this on, on YouTube, and um, and it's you know they have it's like a two minute with music and so forth um, that you can show, and they zoom in on some of the on some of the on some of the solar systems. Hard to see, but up here would be our solar system, okay? And I believe this would just be the, um, wait, so that's, this is just a terrestrial planet. So there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, okay? And so you can see how tiny our planets are and how large the orbits are in comparison to all of these, okay? <clears throat> Same kind of, um, same kind of uh, uh, color scheme. So uh, if you see yellow as the last color, it only has two planets. I think it's green. There are three planets. Um, now we have a seven-planet system. Therefore, it has orange as its outer planet. Okay. <clears throat> so where do, what do we do with all of this? Right. We have now masses. Potentially, we have radii for a lot of these planets. We have distances from their stars. For a few, maybe we have some some atmosphere uh, 
measurements. What do we do with this? How can we actually model the chemical composition? Okay. The first thing that we would do is, well, let's pick what we know, right? Oh, maybe something Earth-like. Okay. Or if it's, if it's, if it's you know, massive, maybe it's something uh, more Jupiter or Saturn-like. So let's try to, to model these interiors. Okay, so these, these are really crude models, and I warn you from the get-go, they're completely non-unique. But the way that we do it is <clears throat> we assume, we assume a, a spherically symmetric planet. Pretty good assumption. Uh, we assume that it's in high, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, and we assume that it's completely differentiated. Okay, so it's made up of layers. So I, I, I draw that here. Okay. And those, um, and of course, then if it's fully differentiated, then each of those layers are going to be of, of you know, some composition. The density is going to be increasing as you go uh, deeper into the, into the planet. Okay. We use these set of coupled equations. Okay. So um, essentially, and We've seen these before. We use, we use some, you know, things like this for the Earth. <laughs> okay. um, what I show here then is we need to know then, or be able to figure, or know, or take equation of state information of how density changes um, with pressure or with, with, uh, excuse me, with radii. So as we go into the planet, and that's going to be a function of pressure and temperature. And composition, obviously. Yes. Um, Paul. Oh. oh. <laughs> You're missing at least one equation. You don't have temperature as a function of radius. That's yeah. Okay. No, you're right. And um, and actually, for these for the, for the calculations here, we're we're assuming equations of state that are from 300 Kelvin. So there's no temperature added into that. I would argue though that be, given the pressures, the intense pressures of these super Earths, and of course for the even larger Jupiter and larger planets, um, that pressure is really going to win out. And so if we're looking only at Okay, okay for terrestrial planets, but for a hot Jupiter, for, you're going to get rather the wrong I'm answer. Talking, I'm only talking about... For the low pressure part. I'm talking about super Earths. Low pressure, right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and the temperature is... But the temperature is also going to be a function of a whole lot of things that, uh, that, we, don't, that we don't know in terms of the physical properties of how these materials behave under those super extreme temperature, pressures and temperatures. Michael. But if you have to... A temperature is the simplest thing to assume it's adiabatic. That would be the, that would be the that would be the first thing to do, right? Would be to assume it's adiabatic. Yeah. Yes. Maybe I missed this. How do we know the super Earths are terrestrial? Um, we don't. But I'm going to show you why we make those in a little bit. Why why we make? Uh... Okay. Great. Um, okay. So equations of state. This is, uh, yeah, this is something that we'd want to know. Um, Wendy, Lars, uh, Paul all have given nice uh, lectures on equations of state. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you with the details of a birch murnahan equation of state. And I'm barely going to bore you with the details of what would be used at these super high pressures. Okay, so I'm going to just really briefly um, go into what, what would be used um, at at higher pressure. So these would be pressures, say, more than 1,000 GPA. The central pressure in the Earth is about 360 some odd GPA. Okay, so this is well above the Earth uh, uh, pressures. Um, so we don't ever think about it. We don't ever use it. But, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a theory uh, that was developed almost 100 years ago um, to describe what would be happening in stars, um, in really big planets, and so forth, in, and to rec recreate those conditions. Actually, I'm going to show some data from, and, and go, building off of Paul's uh, lecture yesterday, on some of these really extreme uh, laser-driven shock experiments. This is actually just a small plug for NIF. So this was NIF, the National Ignition Facility, is... Uh, uh, is based at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. 
Uh, that's a person for scale. This is inside of the chamber um, that where when it's at full capacity, 192 lasers will be focused on one point uh, in order to momentarily, very momentarily on you know sort of 10 nanosecond type time scales, uh, be able to hit and shock uh, a sample. Okay, so it's a massive endeavor. And there was a paper that just came out in Science yesterday. I'll, uh, I'll, I stole some figures from so. <clears throat> Okay, so, for, so, so this, is a, this is a different kind of equation of state that we use for these uh, so really high pressure conditions. And what, um, what the model is, is basically we're going to be treating all of our electrons as if they're just in this gas, okay? So with a birch murnahan equation of state and with solids, right, we're thinking of, of between each of the atoms, we've got sort of this spring, right? We talked about Hooke's law. Okay, and we can we can we can um, we can define like a, a potential well, um, and that potential well might narrow. Okay, when we're pushing them together further apart, they vibrate. Okay, so in this um, in this particular model, though, um, and this was sort of you know uh, 1920, so this is just following sort of quantum mechanics. Okay, this is actually a, a, a classical model, and the only thing that um, is sort of quantum about it is that it assumes that the electrons behave like fermions, that you, Pauli exclusion principle, right? You can't have two in the same place. Okay, so that's the quantum part of this. But otherwise, uh, we're treating each of these electrons as, um, as they're sort of free, in a sort of a free gas, and, um, and so they can move. So they're each going to have a sort of a kinetic energy, and because they're charged, they're each going to have a potential energy based on sort of that kind of electrostatic... Uh, uh, you know, Coulomb's law type of thing. Yes, Greg. So, quick question, Kanani. When, um, so, like for Earth, we, we don't use this equation no. of state. Um, and you're using this for all of these super Earths you're using for? So, so for, at no, what point? No, no. So, we would only be using it at, at sort of pressures greater than 1,000 GPA. Okay, so, you so sort of have to kind of match up the equations of state um, like this. Uh, so, uh, okay, so. So this is from, from Poirier's uh, textbook. So um, <clears throat> here is a Murnahan equation of state, not to be confused with a Birch Murnahan equation of state, but I'm just using it as a comparison. So um, here we have a you know an equation of state for sort of pure iron. Okay. Uh, this little section here would be where the Earth's core would lie, right? We know the Earth's core isn't pure iron. Myrna has not a very good equation of state at these high pressures, but that's a, that's a separate issue. Um, and then what the Thomas Fermi uh, equation of state would um, predict. Okay, so this is this, and I haven't shown any of the I haven't shown any of the equations because there's there's a lot of them. Okay, but basically what it comes down to is z. You know how 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 big this how many electrons it has how and and, and um, uh, so your functional form is going to have a is going to have z in there, okay? And then you make some some um, some uh, assumptions about you know the sort of the volume that each of, that the electrons are sort of in, okay? But even so, there what you see then is if you plot this Thomas Fermi model, okay, it sort of kind of uh, intersects the Murnahan, Birch Murnahan, sort of at these high pressures, sort of about 1,000 GPA here. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna instead of instead of continuing on with the Murnahan, which becomes unphysical at these really high pressures, we might start getting negative pressures, for instance. We would start to use this kind of description. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see where that gets us. from several years ago. This one's actually plotting um, quite a range of masses and radii. Okay, so this is um, uh, masses with respect to Earth. There's the Earth and Venus in the blue triangles. Okay, and this is radius with respect to how many uh, Earth radii. Okay, and so it wasn't that long ago where you had Sort of the solar system planets. So there's a, uh, I 
guess that would be Mars. Yeah, Mars here. And uh, Uranus and Neptune and Saturn and Jupiter up here. Okay. And then the rest of the planets that we actually had found at that point um, are all in pink. Okay, so that's the data. The model, okay, so a model of, in this case, a pure iron planet, a pure MGSIO3 perovskite planet, a pure water planet, and a pure hydrogen planet, okay, will lie as these solid colored lines. So green, red, blue, and lighter blue. On the MGSIO3, is that where we have the breakdown to MGO and SIO2? I don't remember what the details are in here, actually. Um, I, 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 I doubt it, actually. I don't think that they, they modeled. I think this is just assuming just MGSIO3. Yeah, they don't have good phase Yeah. I think that might also be the stitch between the... Outdoor between, outdoor. right. Yeah, so you have a, right, you have a stitch between, um, between the birch murnahan equation of state, which is used below 1,000-ish GPA, and then you have to add on the, the, the Fermi, Thomas Fermi stuff at the end. Sure, so. Um, so let's see, um, 10 Earth masses. Yeah, that would actually that would actually happen much at a much lower uh, much much lower mass. I don't remember what the details were. It's just there's no breakdown of anything. This is very very crude. Um, uh, so so Suki was was saying, uh, you know, there's predictions that MGSIO3 will break down. Um, into say MGO plus silica, or, and uh, we you can play those games, but those are not included here. They're just assuming that it's pro there, there's no even post perovskite in here. It's just perovskite. Okay. <laughs> You're just trying to get an estimate of of where a planet lies in relationship to like, you know, give an end member sort of component if you compress it to really really high pressure. Right. Yes. Absolutely. This is this is this is just to sort of zero order, give us an idea of what that planet might be composed of. And so, for most of the exoplanets that were found at this point, okay, they were planets that look like Jupiter. They were they were hydrogen planets. They were mostly hydrogen planets. And one might say, okay, well, this hydrogen, you know, goes up. But these ones go are bigger that would you know would even a lighter would would just, would would predict a lighter density than even hydrogen. What's lighter than hydrogen, right? Okay, so this is where we get into temperature effects, right? These are hot Jupiters, and this and these equations of state these are based on 300 room temperature 300 Kelvin equations of state. Okay, so this is hydrogen um, at room temperature, and if you've got 2,000 or degrees at uh, that your planet is at, you can imagine that there might be some thermal expansion. Okay. <clears throat> then that gives you some constraints on how much thermal expansion might contribute to, you know, my, you know, if you're using some equation of state, uh, assuming a temperature of 300 K, that gives you some sense of how off your equation of state might. Sure, or how off your your assumptions are on what the yeah. composition is, yeah. because you know, do we actually think that this is a pure? These are pure hydrogen planets that is just thermally expanded. Is there a core? You know, could there be some rocky core or some iron core or something else? Um, you know, you could add a little bit of core and lots of hydrogen and really hot hydrogen, and and still make. So there's so there's a lot there's a lot of game playing to be done. This is completely non-unique. All right, but that's the games that we can start to play. So I'm going to now, instead of being on this log log plot, because I uh, I don't I like thinking in linear, <laughs> I'm going to um, uh, sort of zoom in on the super Earth-sized um, planets. So you know, 10, 10 uh, Earth masses. Okay, um, and this has been updated. Okay, from the from the um, previous. So we actually have quite a few uh, <clears throat> planets that plot. Uh, in this sort of lower mass and lower uh, and smaller uh, radii. Okay. And then again, here we have uh, Earth, Venus, and Mars for, for reference. Okay. Something you'll notice that may have been sort of hidden on the last slide because it was in log log plot are the error bars on these things. Okay. So these error bars are pretty big. 
Okay. So for all the Kepler missions, okay, we have, um, and so all of these have been looked at with transit, with uh, both tra um, uh, with with transit measurements, so we can actually get a, a measure of the the radius. Okay. But there's still quite a lot of um, uh, un, un, uh, uncertainty here. Okay. And even in the masses, there there is quite a bo uh, quite a bit of uncertainty. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> These can come down with different kinds of, I mean, with you know similar measurements done in different wavelengths and so forth, um, but uh, but you know those are the kinds of numbers that we have. All right, so same plot, but one of my own plots. Okay. So now we're going to focus on um, this guy here, 55 Cancri E, and there's actually two measurements here of this particular planet. So this is the this is the um, planet which we showed, like there was, you know, as an example of, of a transiting um, planet in front of its star. The star itself is like 8 billion years old. Um, it's got an 18 hour an 18 hour orbit orbital period, um, and as you can see, it's um, about eight Earth masses and about two ish. Uh, Earth radii. The two different measurements here um, are based on two different wavelengths that were used to measure the uh, radius of this planet. So um, I don't remember which one. One is in the infrared and one was in um, was uh, <coughs> in the visible. So in my notes here it says the the red one is the visible radius, okay? And this is a combination of infrared and visible measurements. Okay, so you can see that there is um, an offset. But we chose this particular one because of all of the ones uh, that have been found, and even if you add the, the later ones um, that have been found, it had the tightest error bars, okay? So we could at least maybe be able to better constrain um, an already non-unique solution, but better constrain it because we know those values better. The reason why we know these values better is because this has been something that has been looked at many, many times by different uh, observers prior to the Kepler mis um, prior to the Kepler mission, and it has both radio velocity and transit and so forth. So we have a lot of data on this particular planet. Okay. All right. So um, based on iron, uh, perovskite, and water. Uh, and our bias of what planets like this should be made of should look like the Earth, right? So you might expect then um, that you know you could kind of have a Earth with a iron and perovskite you know in it, but also lots and lots of water. Okay. Well, lots and lots of water might be okay, but this is a really hot planet. It's got 2,500 degrees measured temperature surface temperature. It's damn close to its star. So instead of thinking of this as, as potentially having a lot of water in it, a significant amount, like you know, more than 20% water in this planet, how much percent water do we have on Earth? We can measure it in ppm, right? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, a, so a small, a small amount of water. Even though we've got oceans and potentially lots of oceans uh, in the mantle, it's still a, a, a very small uh, fraction of the planet. Okay, so we're talking about putting tens of percent of water in order to get, um, you know, the density low enough. Kanani. Yes. Um, maybe I missed it. Yeah. But so, how, how exactly? <clears throat> So, so if things look like they're less dense than they should be, previously when we looked at the hydrogen, this seemed like we could explain it with temperature. Mm -hmm. So how, how confident are we that this is not just a temperature effect? Not. Okay. <laughs> right. One could argue, well, this is just a temperature effect, right? It's just really hot. It's thermally expanded. But if it's, you know, if it's sort of in the solid-ish planet, you know, it's not like we're it's not like we're expanding a, a lot of gas. We're well, there there could be there could be there could be a, a big atmosphere. Absolutely. The atmosphere, right? Absolutely. Is and actually, that's that's that would be the difference between these measurements, right? One is more sensitive to perhaps the atmosphere. Okay. Those those lines are also for pure H2O, pure carbon, pure yeah. Yes. So they're also mixtures of core. You know, there's a lot of degeneracy. Basically, you can have mixtures of, of iron plus 
MgSiO3, and then if it's hot, it puffs up. So, and it has a lot of gas, it'll get puffy. So, there's a lot of a lot of room for uh, a lot of things can happen there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This. The, so. So we're we're not confident. This is this is a very simple simple model. Lars. <laughs> I, I guess there, there's some other material physics constraints that you can bring to bear. So if you do that same calculation for MgSO3 on a 2,000K, 2,500K isentrope, the line will be almost identical. Yeah. Right? It'll move very, very slightly right. and, and won't significantly uh, change your view of, of what the 55 CNCE is. The, the other thing you can say is that given the measured surface temperature of that super Earth, you know what the... Um, what the equilibrium vapor pressure of silicate, uh, mm -hmm. of silicate atmosphere would be, and it's really small. And so you can't explain the radius with a silicate atmosphere or with an iron atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It would have to be uh, a much more volatile component if you want to do it with an atmosphere. Right, which is where the which is where the water would come in. So so if you had sort of 20% water, um, it's not going to look like this, right? <laughs> not it. Not at those high, I'm not at those very high temperatures. Okay. Um, so, so yes, and this, and, 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 and Paul brought this up earlier, right? I mean, the temperature uh, is going to make a big difference for something like a gas, like hydrogen, um, but less so for, um, for the, for the iron and, and silicates. Yeah. Yeah. The thermal expansion coefficient of an ideal gas is one over T. So at a thousand Kelvin, it's of order 10 to the minus three thermal expansion coefficients of metals and silicates are of order 10 to the minus 5. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, temperature much less important for condensed phases in this kind of argument. But poofy atmosphere, but, but poofy, yeah, so, so, a, so a, a poofy atmosphere, which would, you know, which we don't know what that gas would be made up of, but, um, or that atmosphere would be made up of, yes, could poof out a little bit. So, so we can we, we can play all these games certainly. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I, I actually I don't know. Um, but you know, given I mean, I would say take the error bar from here to here, right? Yeah. yeah. They're big, um, but they were the smallest out of the this uh, the few that we actually have. All right, so we can play the game with like, you know, we have lots and lots of water. It puffs out because we, then we have, um, you know, maybe a lot of atmosphere, maybe some super critical water, ocean, something or another. I mean, you know, you can come up with all these, these uh, cartoons in your head of what the planet might look like. Okay? We instead said, okay, well, is there anything else between rock and water, right? I mean, those are pretty different kinds of things. Okay? So, um, we added now two different curves here, which are pretty similar to each other. Uh, one's for carbon, graphite, diamond, whatever you want to call it, um, and silicon carbide. Okay, and they're they're not that different from each other. So, okay, and you you plot them doing the same kind of you know same kind of assumptions that you made for um, the other curves on here. Okay, and it's like whoa, they actually kind of lie right on top of right on top of those measurements, right? I mean, could you? Then one might, one might even uh, dare to say you could even have a planet that would be completely made up of diamond, right? Or completely made up of silicon carbide. Okay. <clears throat> but this is a non-unique solution. Okay. So we can then take all of those n members, or three in this case, because um, because we're going to put together a ternary um, diagram. Okay. And we say, okay, well, just based on Sort of this average density that our mass and radius is given, giving us the two the two observables. Um, <clears throat> we can think of a ternary diagram that's iron, silicon carbide, and carbon, or iron, perovskite, and carbon. And um, the colored sections of the of, of these ternaries uh, would give all possible solutions of the composition of that planet. The red would be based off of um, the one, one measurement, because there were two measurements of the radii, and the blue would be a, a slightly tighter, um, a slightly tighter uh, constraint on that, on that radius. Okay. 
Yes. Plus the uncertain plus the uncertainties in there. Error bars. Yeah. What, what do we expect the, um, for a planet this size, what do we expect the, the pressure to be at the center of the planet? I'll, I'll show, if, I'll show. Okay. it depends, it depends on, on, the, on the particular point that we pick in this ternary. Yeah, I'll, um, in, in like two sides I'll show that. Okay. All right, so, um, uh, so here are the details. So for less than 1,000 GPA, we use birch Murnahan third order equation of state. I should say room temperature here. And then for 1,000 GPA, we use the Thomas Fermi equation of state. Whatever equation of state we use, <laughs> this, this, this problem is always non-unique. Okay. So let's pick a um, let's pick a let's pick a composition. Okay. So this composition it makes for pretty pictures. Um, it makes for the pretty picture that I showed on the on the on the title slide, right? Nice uh, little iron core, a silicate carbide mantle, followed by a diamond sort of upper mantle, and maybe a graphite crust. Okay. This is what, um, so you know, based on, on that sort of um, composition, this is where, uh, this is sort of where um, the masses are, are coming from and, and where those uh, locations in the radii uh, would be. Okay. So we can calculate then what the density would be. So up, I actually have this. So up on the top, we'd have a graphite crust. Graphite quickly turns into diamond at high pressures, so that will be followed by a diamond um, sort of upper mantle, followed by a silicon carbide lower mantle, and then by iron, you can see where we attached the, the Thomas Fermi um, equation of state was around here. You see the huge increase in density, I don't know if that's really real, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> the pressures, and here again, this is where we sort of uh, tacked on the Thomas Fermi part. Okay. So this is in bar, so something like 100 megabar. I would say it's probably less than that because of, because just of the, but the, the composition that we, that we chose. Um, yes. So right now, when seeing this, I don't want to uh, don't want to stop you from what you're doing, but I also want to encourage you to look towards geochemistry and and, and I will. And, and what you will <laughs> find is that there is not as much free space as you're um, yes. bringing us. Yes, I w I'm going to go okay. into that um, in a little bit. In a little bit, we'll, we'll we'll try and put some chemistry in here, as much as we as much as we know it. Right, and when I say no chemistry, no oxygen fugacity, just 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 bulk chemistry. <laughs> right, right. When I say chemistry, for instance, I'll give you um, a perspective that would really speak to how I think about this system. The silicon mag, uh, the silicon iron ratio, mm -hmm. should at some level be fixed because of. Uh, condensation process plus nucleosynthetic processes. That is how we produce the elements. And we actually have measurements on thorium uranium in the galaxy, so we actually know that the, the solar system and the Milky Way look very similar. That is, the sun and the, the other stars look fairly similar in composition. So when I see silicon and iron there, I say, I'm going to demand you put magnesium in there because I know it's there. You cannot do this system in the absence of magnesium. And it will go down a whole list. Absolutely. So, so that's why I said chemistry. Right. No, absolutely. And and the other ternary that I that was you know there were two ternaries on there that that included the perovskite. Um, I couldn't add it in this one if I still wanted carbide, but I could remove the SIC on there and plug in MgSiO3 and it wouldn't look that much different. Right. Right. It wouldn't look that much different. So um, so yes, if there are constraints on the chemistry for this for this I planet. That sentence that way. I would say there are. Constraints. There are no. There are no. I, there are, no, 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 and I will show some constraints. There are some constraints um, based on what we know about the sun, their particular star, right? So if we know something about the composition of the star, what its iron to silicon ratio is, for instance, or as I'm going to 
as what I'll develop is its carbon to oxygen ratio, um, we can then further uh, sort of refine this. Um, uh, this only is okay with just density. This doesn't have any uh, cosmochemistry in it. Kanani? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, back here. Um, so I guess I, I have a question regard that's related to Bill's question, and it, it has to do with sorting of material, both in kind of a protoplanetary disk. I don't n know what are the processes by which you can sort out I guess this I'll goes get to, to what. I'll get but, to that. But but then in the planet that you drew, um, what is causing this radial sorting? Is it just density differences? I mean, would we exp on Earth we know that density differences alone are not what causes planetary sorting, right? I mean, it does for the metallic versus the uh, non-metallic component, but all the other elements are distributed based on what kind of. Uh, uh, molecules they make, right, and what kind of crystals they make, and what what happens during melting and things like that. So how does this relate? Would we expect carbon so to self-segregate like that above a? I I, I don't know chemistry, so no, I'm asking. So so, so the the, the initial one of the initial assumptions was that the planet was fully differentiated, meaning that uh, the densest stuff went down. So you know if there were a lot of uranium, you know then you could have a uranium core. It, 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 it's not, it's not um, bringing into any effects of, uh, of melting and, you know, you've got fractionation or anything like that. It's just gravity. So, yeah, it's, it's very crude. It's very crude. Greg. Oh, wait. <laughs> I actually, I think that brings up an interesting point because, for, for instance, on the Earth, you know, we have all these incompatible elements that end up in like the continental crust, for instance, and so you can get a lot of, we have a lot more crystal chemical variety in continental crust rocks, so maybe the crust isn't actually graphite if you have a lot of other things that, you know, you know, for instance, on Earth we have organic molecules, carbon can do all sorts of weird things, mm -hmm. right, and, you know, for instance, you have boron carbon compounds and things like that. Sure. Uh, when To allay some worries here, all you have to do is take the six most abundant elements for the Earth and do the same model, and you nail the Earth. You don't have to worry about temperature. You don't have to worry about where trace elements get sorted. All you have to all you have to consider is that at some point things were mol molten. You shove all the iron into the core, and you can reproduce the Earth with this sort of model. You remember the uncertainties are very large of what we're looking at. So this is. That sort of assumption is a, it's a good physicist assumption. <laughs> it's better than a spherical cow. Yeah. I don't. I <laughs> yeah. When you say that you reproduce the Earth, are you talking about the radial distribution? So at the bottom you have magnesium, and then above it you have oxygen, and then above. Yeah. So I, I showed um, uh, here. So here, here's Earth and Venus. Earth is right underneath the perovskite curve. So one might expect then that it's, you know, that you, or you could model it as N member perovskite plus iron, okay? And you, okay, you, can, you can make the Earth just with that. But, but and, can you know, any... The amount of, you know, if you want to call it bulk silicate, with the amount of silicates versus, or rock versus metal, um, you would get the Earth. But Kanani, what would happen yeah. if you modeled a magnesium Earth? Because that's kind of what you're doing. You're saying, we have a magnesium Earth or a silicon Earth. Yeah. You're not actually binding them together in these minerals. And that's, I think, Ved's point, is that the certain elements are going to combine together. And it's the equation of state or property of those minerals rather than the individual elements that this matter. Is, uh, okay, MgSiO3 with a little bit of iron and aluminum, birchite, whatever, is the most abundant mineral in the Earth, period. Right, but uh, for example, so. but, but that's, that's different than Mg all by itself. Right, and this is this is for MgSiO3. It's not MgO. Right. So right. when you think about a, a diamond mantle or something like that, that's kind of analogous to saying, imagine I've got a magnesium mantle. So I guess the point is that the chemistry and, and the bonding of the different elements seems like it's going to be pretty important. Absolutely. Okay, so let's try to get to the chemistry then. Um, let me go forward. Okay, so chemistry. 
right. So in this very basic model, uh, and, and I will show some more sophisticated models done by others uh, in a little bit. Okay. So if we take one particular ratio, and since I'm, since I'm, I, I'm suggesting that carbon might be a big component of this particular planet and possibly of lots of uh, super Earths, um, let's look at then the carbon to oxygen ratio. I show here the carbon to oxygen ratio of our sun, okay, is about half at the time that they looked, you know, the measurements for 55 cancri for this, for, for 55, uh, for that particular star, the carbon to oxygen ratio was around one, okay? That's been dropped a little bit, but it's nevertheless greater than, um, than, than half, okay? So, so we're gonna get different chemistry just because the, we have more carbon than we have oxygen, okay? I don't know what the values for iron to silicon, but these are, these are also things measured, I believe, for this star, okay? Because this star has been looked at for the last decade or so. Okay. All right, so now what I'm showing here is we've got an abundance here with respect to hydrogen okay, versus temperature, and temperature uh, is decreasing to the right. Okay. So this, is, this would be an equilibrium type chemistry model. I didn't actually do the model, so I can only ask, answer very basic questions. But the gist of it is, okay, here are the color codes. Okay. Um, is we're looking now at what condenses out of this um, out of this composition. Okay, so put into this model includes the magnesium, the iron, the titanium, uh, besides the carbon, the aluminum. It includes all of these uh, all of these uh, values. Okay. The <coughs> the significance of a carbon to oxygen ratio of one should be pointed out. Most of the carbon and the oxygen in the solar nebula are in the very volatile molecule carbon monoxide, yes. which doesn't condense. So as soon as you go above one, it becomes plausible to contemplate a carbon planet with no oxygen in it. Thank you, right. which is what I was going to try and show, show here. So this would be the sort of the condensation sequence of, of a starting composition, you know, your, your, your nebula around, around um, your star. Um, and when you would start to condense. Okay, so for the sun, we, we know what first condenses, right? You, you learned that in your, in your um, freshman geology classes, right? The first kind of things that are condensing are the most refractory stuff, sorry, maybe that you know, <laughs> or in, your, in, in a planet's class you may have taken or something, okay? Um, but things like MGO and alumina and the calcium, um, which is not shown on here, um, the titanium oxides, the, the really, the stuff that have high condensation temperatures, okay, are gonna be the first things uh, that condense, okay? Um, we also have here, so here's a MGSI 03, okay, in the green. Um, I don't even see silicon carbide on here. Um, although we do have silicon carbide grains, we can see that in our in our uh, stardust type thing. Um, here's iron, whatever. It's it, it, nothing too exciting, but we, you know we see sort of the the oxides that we, we that we that we know about and, and see on, on on Earth. Okay. Now, if you do the same exercise and bump up that C to O uh, ratio, and actually instead of one, um, 0.8 is kind of like the threshold that that they often will use. But this is you know well above that well above one and well above 0.8, okay? What you see is the first thing that condenses because you have this high carbon ratio is silicon carbide, then iron, then carbon, okay? Well, there's some little Fe3C here, so iron carbide. So the first things that are condensing are your iron and your carbon plus silicon. Uh, you have a question? Uh, actually, yes. <laughs> uh, why? Why are, is the carbon-oxygen ratio so much higher? What is the characteristics of the star that are so different? It's just a different, different sun? kind of star. It, it's just another flavor of star. Uh, I, I guess that would have to do with the, the nucleosynthetic, what's going on within that, within that star in, in terms of... Um, uh, no, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a shaking of the head from Wendy. Anyway, it's a different, it's a different kind of star. <laughs> Yeah, it depends mm -hmm. on the details of things like, of what that star formed from, right? Our our star's got carbon in it, but not because our star is making the carbon. It was as it was condensed. And this star is actually really 
enriched in a lot of elements relative to hydrogen com when you compare to our, the sun. So it's got 50% more iron than we do, for instance. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different composition, so you're going <coughs> to get wildly different results. But what, but, but, what we, but, but what I was just trying to show with this, and this is sort of like just a snapshot, like everything, if everything condensed at one time, this would also this would sort of be radially se separated, right? The stuff closer into the star would be um, would be condensing out sort of the carbon stuff. The stuff that were further away from the star um, would be would be condensing out um, uh, the silicates. Here, the, here's here's uh, perovskite in the light green. Um, here's some sulfide, iron sulfide. Okay, these are the more sort of volatile ish things. Okay that are out here. So you would get, if you kind of thought of this model, sort of a, a radial distribution of different planet-making stuff, okay? CI chondrite, whatever flavor chondrite. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a radial distribution, okay? Um, so, so we see this, and we're like, well, the star itself has a high carbon-to-oxygen ratio, then maybe the planet then is made up a planet that's really close up to its to its star was made up preferentially of the of the carbon rich atoms. Or, but that, that, that that's no. I mean, you can have certainly can have mixing, which people have done and shown. Yes. What controls the wiggles? Uh, just uh, the various difference in chem. So here, you know, you have um, what goes down here um, is sort of made up here. Uh, it's just the whatever the, the thermodynamics are between these particular species. I didn't run these models. There's another question in the back. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, just you mentioned that 55 Cancri is actually a, a binary star, A yeah. and B. So was that a composition of the A, of I B, think that was of a both? A. I think that was of A. So I, I'm not too familiar about how the orbits work in this case. Is it orbiting A only? Is it orbiting this combination of both? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's a tricky. Um, it's a tricky. It's a tricky one. Uh, I think B, I think B is far away, so it's it's orbiting A, but B is you know like A is here, B is here, and it's going around this. So we're modeling it after A. I don't, and I don't know what B looks like in terms of how different it is. It could be very different, and that could be looked at very easily, I'm sure. Bill. I was just going to offer some insight into the previous two diagrams, which is to say that the wiggles in some of these diagrams are really just competition between the various competing condensing phases from a nebular environment. Additionally, fundamental to both of the calculations that were previously shown, is the partial pressure of hydrogen because the entire nebula is hydrogen, everything else is trace compared to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it was uh, over 10,000 hydrogen or something like that. It was all scaled to hydrogen. Right. That, depending upon, and generally it's treated as orders of magnitude, uh, uh, partial pressure of hydrogen, depending upon that, it really dramatically changes which are the condensing phases at different times. Okay, so um, you can play this game, you know, adjusting your carbon to oxygen ratios and then calculating, you know, what the phases are going to be coming in and, and, and that's fine. So that would, uh, that would be considered sort of this like equilibrium condensation, sort of everything just kind of condenses out at all at the same time, um, but at different distances. Or you can model it, um, and so this is a recent paper that came out last month or something, um, where you uh, have a sequential condensation. So some, you know, as you're condensing things out, say you're condensing um, uh, whatever you're condensing out, it's going to remove that, as Bill said, from the from the equation, right? If you're if you're if 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 it say maybe further distances where you're where you're um, maybe condensing out, say, water ice or something like that, now you're removing that oxygen and hydrogen from the rest of the stuff that are condensing. 
Okay, so you can sort of look at a sequentially over some finite amount of time, and we and we think that this stuff, hap you know, planet building happens over a finite amount of time, that you could have sequential condensation. Okay, and so as you're condensing things out, you're you're removing that from the from from the gas, and um, therefore your C to O ratio is constantly changing, or whatever ratios you want you, you care about are constantly changing over some finite amount of time. And so they tried to model that. And um, so that's the differences between the two columns. And between each row are difference, differences in initial starting C to O ratio. Okay. Busy, busy slide. You can see that they're very different. The colors look very different between the two. Okay. All right. Uh, this is sequential. This is equilibrium. So this is this is basically what I showed on the last slide. Okay, and here's 55 Cancri. So that's kind of what you would see here. Um, this is based on distance from the star rather than temperature, but they scale. And it's log plot, so it looks slightly different. Uh, you know, uh, log in radius here rather than linear in temperature. What's the purple line in the upper left, guys? Carbon. Carbon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can see carbon uh, uh, is condensing, and it's condensing over a pretty wide range of distances from the star, okay? and in, in quite a, a large abundance in comparison to this other stuff down here. Okay? So condensation, though how you co condense out of, the, out of the planetary nebula is, um, is, is going to matter. Okay? Also, how fast you're going to accrete, so the rate of accretion is also going to matter. And so in this paper, they looked at um, how fast you're accreting. So you can, uh, these have no units, but it's basically three times. So the, the lightish green is three times as fast than the, than the blue. But the faster you're accreting, the faster you're taking out things like oxygen out of the, um, oxygen or whatever you care about out of the equation. Um, <coughs> uh, and so uh, if the faster you're accreting, you can actually have more carbon as native carbon uh, in your sort of solid material if you accrete really fast all the sort of volatile stuff, okay, as compared to something a third of the rate. And yeah, that's what this is showing here. Here is showing um, based, on, based on the um, accretion rate and based off sort of this uh, the differences between a sequential condensation versus all at once condensation. All at once condensation would lie here in this sort of dashed lines. Okay, so you would only so with different uh, carbon to oxygen ratios, um, you would only expect to get a little bit of car not that much carbon, but only here at about one AU, not far away from one AU. Whereas if you sequentially condense, okay you can actually have a lot of carbon way up close to the star and extending far beyond that. Okay? So you could have a lot more mixing of carbon throughout the planetary disk, uh, depending on how you, um, how you condense it. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so we're running, we're running out of time, but I wanted to mention, since we are talking about carbon, some very new measurements that uh, just came out yesterday in science. So um, Paul talked about these really high pressure uh, laser shock experiments. Um, this one they happened to do on diamond. The highest pressures they reached were five terapascal. That is 5,000 GPA or 50 megabar. The earth is at three and a half megabar. Okay, so this is significantly higher pressures. The, the data is actually in the blue curve here. There's some significant error bars, whatever. Okay, here's a central pressure we think of Saturn for sort of scale. Huh? Okay, five terapascal. Okay. <laughs> um, here's, uh, yeah, so here's, uh, here's the data. Now I'm showing this because I wanted to actually look, zoom in on this part here. And since I talked about the Thomas Fermi kind of equation of state, um, and then, you know, uh, well, Lars didn't really talk about density functional theory, but these are, you know, theories that have been used to describe these really high PT conditions of, ma of materials like diamond and so forth. You know, what does that look like in terms of the model? And so at high, um, at low pressure, so this is just down here, here's where, here's where uh, static diamond cell experiments would, 
would plot the, the density versus pressure. Um, and the, the density functional theory, its cold curve matches that beautifully. The NIF data it would show right here. And then the various different flavors of the Thomas Fermi model, treating it as an electron, are showed, uh, treating you know, everything as just an, uh, electrons, um, <coughs> are shown here. Um, so they don't do very well at low pressures, but you can see as you increase the pressure here, um, your sort of the overlap between density functional theory and the Thomas Fermi, this particular Thomas Fermi model here in the green actually shows pretty well. So it's, I mean, big uncertainties and so forth, but it actually shows like we've gone to a region where the Thomas Fermi model is appearing to work. Okay, this is the really, the, the super high pressures. Okay, so it's a, um, as Paul was saying yesterday, you know, maybe the experiments and the calculations are actually, you know, agreeing with each other, perhaps. <clears throat> okay, so well, how does that change the carbon equation of state that I had plotted before? So if you, had, um, so this is a much larger scale here, and it's in log plot, but this is mass over earth mass and radius over radius, uh, earth radii, okay, and the blue is what this new equation of state would be, okay. So it's a li it gets, it gets sort of, um, starts to go over the, the water, the water curve here at the super high pressures, and there's Saturn and Jupiter for sort of reference. I am way out of time, but, um, and I have so many more slides, but I, I just want to finish off because everyone's hungry and wants coffee, that, um, that this is, uh, you know, there are a lot of sort of questions that can be asked, and many of them were asked today, but there are many more, right? Uh, I wanted to show, and I'll just show the figure. So, um, <clears throat> so a former Siderite um, uh, came in Unterborn, okay, uh, actually looked at how diamond would affect convection in sort of a terrestrial-sized planet. Um, and this is a really busy, a really busy, I, I'm not going to be able to do it justice in terms of explaining it, but basically what he came up with is that <clears throat> in order to get a Rayleigh number large enough to get convection, so to hit a critical Rayleigh number, you could only have as much as 3% carbon um, in the planet. Okay, now this is for a Earth-sized planet. Okay, um, and this, so this, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that are uh, put into this, but uh, you know, why? Why could you only have very a little bit of carbon um, to get to get convection? And this is, you know, based on the extremely different uh, differences in um, in the physical parameters of, say, rock MgSiO3 versus uh, diamond. Um, carbon, diamond, and, or silicon carbide, whatever flavor you want. And I'll end there. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right.